Thank you for joining today on Side by Side. This recording has been done for the 18th of January and we're moving to Proverbs chapter 3. I'm trying to find sometimes a thread that will link all the different types of Proverbs together and it's really quite tricky. In fact, that's part of the whole style of Proverbs, that they don't lend themselves so easily to the simple A, B, C, 1, 2, 3, 4. But there are times when clear themes come through. And today we're going to think about the theme of trust and about truth and about peace, things that are crucial, things that really do shape our lives. The word here that is very significant and not immediately obvious, or maybe not even obvious at all in the English translation, is the word peace or shalom. Listen to the first two verses. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments for length of days and years of life and shalom or peace they will add to you. Peace or shalom. I think that this is really the great incentive or motivation as we think about Proverbs because shalom is is a theme that we find throughout the whole of the Bible. The world was created in a state of shalom, that beautiful interrelation of harmony and peace, and the world will be recreated to a place of shalom. And so it ought to be really the focus of our lives. And I think Jesus is the one who constantly is saying, you know, my peace I give unto you, not as the world do I give it, give I unto you and such like. So shalom is central to what Jesus is doing. He comes to win back the shalom for us through the offering of his own life sacrificially. And so here the the way we are encouraged to think about shalom is to think about the teaching. My son, do not forget my teaching. Paying attention to the teaching, understanding the teaching, wrestling with that teaching will lead to a peacefulness, a deep peace in our hearts. And I would imagine that if we, instead of focusing on the shalom itself, we focus on the teaching, the shalom will become the fruit of that. We're told also that we should guard, we should guard this truth, means we should value it, value it deeply in such a way where we we want to treasure it And of course, we're told to guard it in our lives and in our hearts. And that's where we really store away the teaching of God. If I I was to ask you this question, what is the operating system of your life? In other words, why do you behave the way you do? Why do you act the way you do? What are the reasons that drive you on? This is, the, this is asking us to examine our hearts. It's here where our belief is forged and shaped. It's here where our belief wrestles, as it were, and is, comes to a, a full understanding that we then translate it into actions. Isn't that what we read in the New, the New Testament, where Jesus tells us that out of the fullness of the heart does the mouth speak? In other words, what you really believe, the place where you really believe in your inner being is going to shape what you say and, of course, the thoughts that form before the words are spoken. So then, what is it that informs your heart? What's shaping your heart? Whose teaching is shaping our hearts? Just right now, I'm reflecting on the the death of one of our dear members in the congregation, Pat Boyd, who passed away last Thursday. And we ask this question, where are we to find peace in this? What does the Lord say? How does he teach us? What does he, what does he instruct or how does he instruct the breaking heart that enables us to weep but still rejoice and know that shalom? You see, in the deep place we have peace, though on the surface we may have many turmoils of, emer- of emotions, I was walking along the the west strand, the east strand this morning with our little dog. First time on the beach. 
and lovely to see her just enjoying that that wonderful place that I hope she's able to see many times. But as I was looking out into the deep ocean, the waves were fairly big. The surfers were enjoying the waves and it was just a turbulent surface. But if, if you and I were able to submerge ourselves even 20 or 30 feet below the surface, what would we discover? We would discover, we'd discover a calmness, a stillness, a serenity that the diver knows and that the fish live among. You see, I think that's a very, very good picture. The teaching of the Bible, the teaching of God, creates within us a deep calmness in our hearts. And even though there may well be turbulence on the surface and emotional ups and downs, it's, it's maintaining that inner calmness through really believing and trusting. Listen to what the Bible says here in 1 Thessalonians. We do not want you to be uninformed. Jesus died and was raised to life. We also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring him back or will bring back with him the believers who have died. There's a truth that the Bible teaches that really gives stability to our hearts in a time of grief. That word, that very convincing word is raised, points to the events that are central to our Christian faith. Since hope only in this life is a cause for pity, this teaching, talking about death, says we can grieve with hope because we have one who was raised to life and who will bring back with him the believers who have died. I mean, think of some of the things that the Bible teaches about death. We know that the body sleeps, as it were. It's a way of describing what happens to our bodies. They return to dust. But our spirit lives. Because the Bible teaches eternal life has already begun, even in the midst of life. John 5, 24 tells us that those who believe have right now eternal life. And this is understood then when we die to be an experience of death. Oh, sorry, of gain. Sorry, the dog is biting my hand right now. Ah! Ah! Anyway, this is understood as gain. Philippians 1.21 tells us that. It tells us that for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. John 11 tells us that when we die, we enter into life. In fact, that's sometimes how I describe death to people. I say, no, they have just entered into life. It also tells us that we are present immediately with the Lord, absent from the body, present with the Lord, and that our spirits are with Christ and they are made perfect. Hebrews 12, 23. The Bible also teaches that Jesus destroyed death and that death cannot separate a believer from God. We read that in Romans 8 and 38 and 39. These are really amazing things. These are the truths. These are what the Bible teaches. And so when we read in Proverbs 3, My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. That's what it means. These are the teachings. Of course, you say, and, 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 and how can I do that? I feel weak and frail. Well, go on to those very, very well-known verses just a couple later. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths or make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. But the word, the weight of the word is to be on the word trust. Trust is, it really means to place our full weight upon him and upon what he has said. His character is trustworthy. His words can be truly believed. And then, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ has come to confirm all of that. So when we read about the, the Lord Jesus being raised to life, all this talk about resurrection has a whole new sense of confidence, hasn't it? God is not asking us to trust in our trust. He's not asking us to have big faith. No, no, he's asking us to trust him, the almighty, powerful God of the universe. Leaning not on our own understanding. In other words, not thinking we know better. 
but simply trusting, even when other people will say it's foolish, it's stupid to believe all those things. We know it's not. We have proved it time after time. And I trust you'll experience that even today.